Duke in Altum is the title of this building with so much meaning. And this morning we're going to have a special Duke in Altum theme, reality, something you might be surprised to hear. But actually something that in a way is also normal here. We're going to hear about it this morning. We invited a special guest, just waiting for him to come in. I'm new at this here, you know. This little bringing somebody on to be a guest to share the live stream this morning. So I'm going to be delayed with this a little bit. Taig, I'm inviting you in again. This is the second time. See if you can, if there's something you have to do on your end. We did a run last night. And it worked. We had downpours of rain yesterday. You can see some of it still gathered here on this cover. Very uh, active thunderstorm. It still says it's adding you a I don't know what's going on there. There's some little thing. Maybe you need to do something. Is there something you need to say yes to? If you can hear me, Taig is in Jerusalem. on these things, so I'm not sure if there's something else I should do on mine, but I've sent you the invitation a couple of times, Tyke. It says you're watching, but I don't see you here yet. must be some little trick, some little technical there that we need to do. I wonder what it is. Were you able to hear me this morning, people? As I realized my sound was turned off, but maybe that just happened a moment ago when I switched over to check if there was a WhatsApp message. Want to try again, Tig?
So I'll just mention a couple of words while we're waiting. Hopefully this is going to f come on. It's given me a chance to invite you again. Taig, if you're still there, it says there's no answer from the live guest. So apparently you have to do something. Oh, very good. But it says you want to join, so let's try here. Approve. There's something strange going on. It says it's adding you now. Oh, there you are. There we go. We've beaten technology, Father Kelly. We finally got them. Okay. That's good. We got you straightened out as well. You Now you're standing on, on your straight up. <laughs> okay. You, you turned the phone. Thank you, you for your start. patience. I know it could be uh, testing, trying to get these things yeah. to work. I've, I've, I've no idea what the strategy is here. So I need to uh, introduce you to our guests who are live and to many, mm -hmm. many more who are asleep right now and who will join, who will hear this later on today. So Taig and I are new to each other, but there's something that brings us together. And I don't know if you allow me to tell a little story, Taig, just to prepare the way. There's lots of things we could talk about, but time goes very quickly. And what I would, uh, like to share something I learned, I'm not sure, 12, 14, 15, 16 years ago here, was the interfaith encounter, an association of groups around the country here in Palestine and in Israel of Muslims, Jews, Christians coming together. And there's one story that I particularly relished. And I think I've spoken about this sometimes to some, I'm not sure if I've, I think I've done it even online or maybe at the masses, I did it a couple of times as an example during a homily. But there was a group at, I think it was Hebrew University of students, nursing students who were specializing in maternity, in the birthing of babies. And in that area, because it's a sacred area of life, each religious outlook has its own sensitivities and its own expressions and maybe prayers or whatever, depending on how religious people are and so forth. And these women who were studying this career were meeting together, Muslims, Christians and Jews, to present to each other how each faith community sees and lives that very special moment and I was deeply touched because it told me they really want to respect the reality of the other and their sensitivities and obviously when they would be working professionally in clinics and hospitals and so forth or maybe going to visit a family where there's an, uh, an emergency birth that they can come with well prepared to know all the sensitivities of the family according to their faith and that they could deal with that in a wonderfully respectful way and i was deeply touched by that level of interest and appreciation and respect in in that area 
So I hope that group is still going and I haven't had very active contact since I came here to Galilee with the interfaith encounter, but uh, I find that very, very interesting. Is that, do you, are you familiar with that story or with that group? I know of that group and the Interfaith Encounter Association at present has 126 groups all across the Holy oh, really? Land. Because whether I, or not that one... Hmm? No, go, 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 keep going. I was going to say, whether or not that particular one is active, currently I'm not sure, but um, there's a plethora of different types of groups for different demographics within the Interfaith interest sphere, like nurses or women or young people, etc. Could you give us one or two other examples that maybe see that really people raise an eyebrow and say, oh, wow, that's interesting. Sure. So uh, we have, for example, a Jordan Valley women's group, which is made up of Muslim, Jewish and Christian women who inhabit the Jordan Valley area. And they meet up on occasion once or twice, sometimes three times a month. And basically, it's like having an open forum format for discussion. People are bringing food. It's like an event for the day almost that people are coming together. But more than just the casual chit chat, which in and of itself is a wonderful thing, people are also sharing their perspective of how living in their community compares with the living in the other. And it's not to say you've got it better than me or why did you do that to myself? But some people are not aware of the challenges that others are facing in different communities. Someone in Mera Diomim, for example, might not realize that there was a new checkpoint put in in a certain place. And a person in a different village might realize that there were activities going on in their town that made them feel uncomfortable. So just spreading this word between communities acts as a forum in the region, as well as between women, as well as between faiths. So there's multiple levels of utility when you bring these groups together. That'd be one example. Yeah, beautiful. And so we, we need to maybe back up now a little bit. So that's our, our topic for our conversation this morning. And maybe we just say a couple of words about yourself, Ty. Where do you come from? Were you born on the planet Earth, or did you come from another planet? Or <laughs> No, despite the large shape of my head, I am an Earthling. Uh, I was born in London, uh, Irish Anglo family, and I've been living in the Holy Land now going on 11 years, mostly in Jerusalem. Uh, I also only, so, so you've known the Interfaith Encounter Association for a long time. I've only been familiar with them from this year. Uh, but I've been involved with interfaith initiatives for the whole 11 years that I've been here in terms of a theological interest. But now it's interesting to see it come out in a, you know, person to person on the ground interest in terms of cooperation. Uh, so I help development of various nonprofit organizations, including the Interfaith Association. That's fantastic, Ty. And when did you come here first to, to the Holy Land? So, you know, doing a full circle, the first time that I came to the Holy Land was volunteering on a kibbutz called Neve Shalom Wahat al Salam, which translates as the Oasis of Peace. And the concept behind the village or kibbutz, as it were, is that it would be a communal space where Jewish, uh, Muslim, and Christian families, Arab, Israeli, and even I think Bedouin, can come together and live in one community, share one school, share one community center hall. And that was the, the ethos of the kibbutz. Yeah, fantastic. And then uh, you obviously um, got familiar with the culture here. Was there any person in particular that, that stole your heart? Any person in particular? Well, you know, this is the incredible thing about living in Jerusalem is that it truly does feel as much as the rest of the Holy Land, like the center of the earth. You know, you've got untold millennia of people passing by this land as conquerors or pilgrims or merchants or travelers. Every person leaves their little grain of sand on the beach here. And so when you just walk around the streets of Jerusalem on any given day, you never know by happen chance what kind of people you're going to bump into and meet. But I think you met um, somebody at the kibbutz. Uh, ah, okay, fair enough. Sorry, you, are you right? I'm going to be castigated now for not having mentioned that. I'm married for 10 years now, and I met my wife on the kibbutz. Wow. So yes, of course, you. Uh, thank you for reminding me. That is above and above all else. 
So, you know, it's funny, we had a, a volunteer here in Magdala, and this volunteer uh, is from Mexico. His name was Carlos. And he found an amazing uh, discovery here, uh, which is still at the University of, of Haifa, and it's a Roman period sword. So that was a mm. sensational discovery. There was always something exciting to share with the pilgrims. So then uh, when the pilgrims would come and visit, and if Carlos was around, I'd say Carlos came to Magdala and he had two major discoveries. And he's still trying to figure out which one was the most important one. Because he found a Roman sword in its sheath, but he also found Rachel. And they were the first people to be married at the altar here behind the big window of Duke and Alton. And it was only 14, 50 degrees as summer, 1st of August wedding, so it was a little hot. So there's a competition between her and the sword in, well, in her eyes then? Well, that's the way I put it, you know, I know cause and trouble. <laughs> yeah. So let's go, let's go on further then to, uh, to a little business. Normally everybody that's following the live stream, most of them are, are overseas from here. There's a few Israelis and uh, different friends also who see it here in, in Israel and Palestine. But uh, most people are getting very, very bad news of the region. And they're mm. probably shocked to hear that here in Magdala, for example, our staff comprises Druze, um, Bedouin by, let's say, racial background. Uh, you have uh, Muslims, um, you have uh, Jews uh, who may be more believing or less believing, usually very secular, maybe, maybe atheistic as well, agnostic. You have uh, maybe even one or two messianic ones and you have Christians of different uh, shades and stripes. And so we have this blessing here at Magdala to have a very varied staff. But people nowadays with the impressions of the conflict would seem to think that it's impossible. And you even started a new encounter group in October after the 7th of October. Correct. Our most recent group that was formed was on the 26th of October. Wow. The twin 26th of October, that's exactly just less than three weeks after the horrible events that kicked off this, this brutal moment in history. And the Interfaith Encounter Association started in 2001 on the cusp of the Second Intifada. So conflict, rather than begotting division within society, often counterintuitively brings people to a position where they question what is the root of their presupposition of the other, and it actually inches people closer towards an understanding rather than against. Obviously, that's not the case in every situation, but as a general trend. Absolutely. And actually, one of the lines that I'm finding sharing with a lot of people now in the last week or two is that uh, actually, uh, you know, we, we think that people are good during good times and in bad times, people are all bad. But in fact, we even have in our Catholic tradition uh, and actually Lutherans as well, in times of the Second World War, for example, we have saints who were canonized and they actually gave their lives uh, in the context of the atrocities of the Second World War in the concentration camps. And um, I think of Maximilian Kolbe, who had an extraordinary, he rose to extraordinary virtue in a uh, Polish man uh, in the concentration camp, Edith Stein, others. They, we, we, we can love God and we can reach a fullness of humanity when we're really put to the test. I fully agree. And I'd say that once a crisis does come up, you see the different light in people shine out because they realize that if not now, when am I going to actually act above and beyond myself and try to make an effort to bring things better? I mean, just on the most low level proximal example, two or three days after the war started, when there were still rocket barrages coming on Jerusalem quite often, I went down to the local supermarket and it's bordering on a neighborhood with an Arab uh, village, technically on the east side of Jerusalem. And you'd walk in and you wouldn't know that there was any schism between Jews and Muslims in the, in the supermarket. They were together, about one third of the customers were Arabic from an Arab neighborhood, two thirds of them were Jewish Israeli. Most of the people working at the supermarket were Orthodox Muslims. And there wasn't a bad word or a bad glance or a bad 
vibe at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Everyone was going out of their way to be smiling and warm to one another and show that, you know, despite the background of conflict, this doesn't affect our relationship. If anything, it brings us closer together. And uh, these are things that it's very hard to make a headline in the news when you're looking at optics of uh, bombs and warfare. But uh, it definitely is the story on the ground, at least in places here like Jerusalem and most of the rest of the of uh, the country as well. That's an amazing tie. This is so beautiful to hear that there's light in the darkness, that the sun rises every day here, even though there's the, the backdrop of such horrible violence. No. And a, a wonderful statistic that came out of a friend of mine who works in emergency services in Jerusalem is he was saying that there was a record number of East Jerusalemites that were in some way engaging in auxiliary aid to the state of Israel, like donating blood, volunteering for emergency services, taking tourniquet courses for first aid. So even though they might not be understandably on the political our aim of supporting the war effort, they are supporting the humanitarian effort of the country in ameliorating the effects of the war as well. So people's call to action, if anything, in the country has been one to help rather than to exacerbate the conflict. This is amazing. Uh, this is amazing. Taik, why don't you take a minute to tell us about the new initiative that's starting? And I already posted a link. So once this post is up completely, uh, it will be available to all the viewers and this is also going to be seen on YouTube and mm -hmm. so the people can find the link there also. Uh, what's the new development that um, Yehuda and you and the leadership in uh, Interfaith Encounter are, are developing at the very moment? Sure. So so the basic idea of what we're doing is a live event series that will be very much be like an online TV show where every other week we will be bringing community and religious leaders or people from interest groups like students or women's groups of each different religion. So you'd have one Muslim, one Christian, one Jew coming together physically in person at a roundtable discussion and having so, something like a podcast format uh, conversation where they'll talk about topical issues that are related to interfaith cooperation in the local communities and also letting people know about what initiatives there are regionally for them to be involved in and also fielding questions from the live audience as well. So at the beginning of the war, I noticed that there was a huge uptick in interfaith prayers where disparate groups or individuals would organize a prayer session between faiths. And that was wonderful to see. And I saw some great speakers and people coming up with great ideas. But unfortunately, one of the drawbacks was that it was always in that COVID Zoom format where you've got a hundred little squares and everyone's illuminated by the laptop light in the bedroom. and just didn't engender a whole lot of, uh, you know, aesthetic enjoyment to uh, be involved with, even though the core idea was wonderful. So we're just sort of creating more of a podcast TV type series. So the first series episode that's coming up is on Monday at 7.30 Jerusalem time. And we're having one Jew, one Christian, one Muslim who are in their own right community leaders <coughs> in different places in the Holy Land are coming together in Jerusalem and they're going to be broadcasting live uh, on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube. And as the series goes on episode by episode, there'll be different topics, different participants, and we'll also open the call up to various organizations around the Holy Land of different faiths and different interests to bring participants and speakers forward as well. And not only does this allow domestic people in the region here the opportunity to see the, uh, let's say, the inspiration and the direction to take in terms of interfaith cooperation, but also hopefully it'll come to a size where we'll have some sort of a feedback for the, let's say, observer world in the Western world or in Africa, Asia, wherever people are interested, to see, as you said before, that despite the non-stop headline optics of bombing and warfare, the actual situation in the Holy Land in terms of intercommunal and interfaith cooperation amongst the vast, vast majority of the population is actually gaining momentum 
rather than being stalled or having a detriment put upon it. And one, one last thing I think we should just cover is that the Interfaith Encounter Association, IEA, is also present outside of uh, Israel and Palestine in other countries. Correct. There are several chapters outside of the Holy Land. I believe up until this point that most, if not all of them, are in America. But we are definitely open to being able to form chapters in any country, in any place, wherever there is a relevancy and a pragma pragmatic ability to be able to coordinate it. Fantastic. Fantastic. I just want to say a word about the readings today because our normal fair is... Uh, the, let's say the main line topic or track of our thoughts uh, hinges on the daily readings and today we have two readings that are pertinent and one of them is um, even to our discussion now the first one is from the book of wisdom and it's ad addressing the author of the book of wisdom which really then but inspiration is seen as also God himself He's going to call the judges, the judges meaning also the leaders, the political leaders, the community leaders of the world, the national leaders, the empire leaders. They're going to be called to judgment. And that there's no difference between a leader and the smallest, most unknown person on the face of the earth, that they're all God's uh, creation and that they all are called to act with wisdom and not in selfish interests and we can have that prayer today and the second reading is from the gospel and it's about the 10 lepers who were healed which is an event that's remembered in in um in the west bank north of the almost uh, in the jezreel plain and the hills of samaria that merge into the jezreel valley and there's still a little church remembering that uh, village event where one comes back and he was a Samaritan. And there we see also, a, in a certain sense, an interfaith encounter in the gospel where uh, Jesus asked, well, is it only this Samaritan who come, came back to say thanks? So in a certain sense, the unexpected person comes to say thanks. And I would love to say thanks on behalf of all of our participants this morning. They probably also expressed that in their notes to thank you, Tig, for getting up early and getting out there in this beautiful spot to participate with us and share so much goodness that's happening here and that people can have a different conversation today at table with their family and friends and then their social media. I think I invite everybody here to share this conversation widely with everybody you think of. Think of your church leader, think of uh, your, your rabbi, think of your, your imam and send this to them and give them hope that all their efforts to build peaceful communities uh, is not in vain, that there are many people working in this degree, they're not alone. And you, we, let's see what the Lord can provoke through this wonderful encounter this morning with Thai. Thank you so much. And I would, like, I would like to thank you very much for having me on. I know that uh, might was a technical difficulty. So if you share this to anybody, you might want to give them a note to say there's a few minutes at the beginning with a technical issue. Um, but no, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to speak with both yourself and see the beautiful sunset in the Galilee. Sunrise, sunrise. Uh, I'm sitting, sun, yeah, sorry, sunrise in the Galilee. I'm sitting in Jerusalem at the moment, so I'm not going to see. I do. It's peeping out the corner, so we can both see the same sun. If you just touch the screen, maybe we can see the sun over there. Our, uh, sun is yeah, rising. Our sun is rising. If you just touch where the light is on the screen, you move over to the side a little bit. Maybe where's the sun? To your right or to your left there? Yeah. If you touch the My. screen a little bit with your finger, maybe that will bring up the sun more clearly. Just uh, hit, the not screen. Sure. hit the screen. It's, really you... we hit... it's okay. okay. It's okay. We'll have to practice that a little sometime. Very nice right. there. Beautiful spot. Beautiful oh. park. Um, thank you, Ty. God bless you. See you later, alligators, everybody. And then we're going to come on on Instagram in a few minutes, Ty, okay? And, but a very sharp Sounds note. Good. Okay, God bless you.